Um, welcome to the talk of Marcus Wienand about modern SQL. Uh, Marcus is independent author, trainer, and consultant concerning all topics concerning SQL. Uh, yeah, listen to his talk and enjoy. Thank you. So let me start with simple questions. Who of you is using SQL? Okay. Who is using SQL 92? Uh, Come on. Nobody knows, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, who is using something more modern than SQL 92? Who even knows there is something more modern than SQL 92? <laughs> so, there's a problem. You see, nobody's using Windows 3.1, I hope. Is anyone using uh -huh. Windows 3.1? Uh, <laughs> there's always one. <laughs> um, so, you see, um, it's obvious that we don't use those old operating systems, but for some extent, many people are still stuck in the SQL 92 mindset. And this is something I'm working against. I would like to use this talk to show you um, what new features the SQL standard has introduced in the past 25 years. For the, for the recording, for the <coughs> Okay? Okay. No? It's fine, for everybody. Can you hear me? Um, All right, welcome. Then let's um, stop. And I'm going through some more recent versions of this standard and just show you some hand-picked um, features out of these standards, where I think more people should know and use those. So I'll just start chronologically. So I start with the latest release then <coughs> after SQL 92. Um, SQL 92, just to tell you, is basically what everybody believes SQL is. And everything which happened afterwards is what you have missed. <laughs> so that was SQL 99. And one of the features introduced there were recursions. Who knows that? With recursive. Oh, quite a few. Okay, so what is it for? Um, I'd like to first demo one of the use cases and actually the problem you have had with SQL 92 when you were approaching this use case. So if you have like here, let's say a hierarchy that is implemented with these pointers to parent records like I have here on this table and some of these um, each of these squares is basically a row there. Then you can do things like, yeah, well, you can put one and pick one. And you might then have questions like, okay, who are all the descendants there? How to find them? And this is actually not really solvable in SQL 92, but nowadays it is. And I would like to show you uh, how that works nowadays. So the first step is quite easy. You just pick the starting point. If you have the, the idea of that, let's say, uh, maybe 42, um, you just pick that one. And then it's the question, how to find the child? And the first step is still quite easy, because SQL 92 has union. So we can add more results to the same result set. That's easy. Because here we can use basically the same ID, the same 42, but instead of looking for the, uh, um, for the ID column, we are looking for the parent. And then we have the next level of, of charts. But you see, it only goes that far. I cannot do a second union because I don't have the pointer to the grandparent. 
That's just not there. What we actually need to find the full, the full hierarchy is we need to somehow get the result of this query into that query again. And this is basically what you can now do. And the syntax is quite simple. It's not a lot, it fits there on the screen. You can basically copy and paste this into any modern database and it will work. And it does exactly what it does. So um, you have, of course, the self-reference is a little bit tricky. You do a, a join there with this pref, which is, which is just a name to the result set. And then you have this indirect pointer there, which means I'm processing my own output in the very same query. And then I'm doing hierarchy for hierarchy, step for step, I'm just finding the next um, items there. And you will get one long result where all uh, those items are in there. And this was introduced with SQL 99, and you could basically use it. Okay. Um, that's just one of the use cases, of course. It's a rather simple one. The general use case of this um, is processing graphs in any kind. So you can, introduce, you can implement pretty much every algorithm um, for graph processing in SQL by now. It doesn't always make sense, I must admit, but you can. And there are even papers analyzing performance behavior when they compare SQL solutions to more specialized solutions like Neo4j or some, some graph um, language. And they find in some cases when the data gets big, um, they might even be faster in SQL databases because when you implement the same algorithm in multiple uh, environments, when the big O notation is basically the same, what makes the difference are the implementation details. And when it comes to big data, databases are quite well optimized for these cases. So there are some cases where it is even faster than in a specialized uh, graph database. Um, another use case which I use quite often actually is to find uh, distinct values. You can basically just hop through a sorted result and just find the next distinct value very fast. So there is an article on the internet on the Postgres wiki for that. And another one is row generators, just generating rows out of nothing, most commonly used to generate nest data. So if you need a million rows, just, just do this query, and it just uh, generates you a million of rows, and you can do your tests and whatever. So this was introduced with SQL 99 into the international standard. And yeah, the international standard is basically just a, a pile of paper. Well, not even. It's just a PDF to download. Um, what does, do the vendors actually do? And there you see I have checked um, seven databases. And in the meanwhile, if you look at our good friend MySQL, <laughs> in the meanwhile, even MySQL has learned that SQL did not stop to evolve with SQL 92. So this is just one feature out of this SQL 99 standard. There are many, many more features, but uh, yeah, my slot here is limited. So I go on to the next standard release that was then introduced, it was 2003. And this was actually a really big one. So there were window functions. Who knows window functions? Who loves window functions? Even more. Yeah. Who understands window functions? Uh, uh, it's actually not so complex. Um, I have separated into three distinct um, topics, subtopics for window functions. I start with the partition pie, basically. But before I start with that, I will again highlight what is actually the problem. What was the limitation in SQL 92? And it turns out um, SQL 92 has combined two concepts which are actually independent of each other. And the one is that you can merge rows that have some common attributes, basically. So you can do this with group by, or maybe with, with distinct, if all of the attributes are the same. And the other concept is aggregations, like some min, max, and so on. And they are actually intermingled, as you see. If you do it, look at it like a matrix, if you have neither merging of rows nor use of aggregates, then you have just a simple query like that. And then you can, on the one axis, you can say, OK, now I'm, I'm adding to merge some rows which have some attributes in common. So if I use distinct, it basically merges all the rows that have all attributes in common. OK, so far so good. And on the other axis, I'm adding whether or not you are doing some aggregates. And there you see, OK, you can use aggregates if you use group by to merge the rows which have some selected attributes in common. So far, so good. What about the gap? And this is what is now uh, possible with SQL 9, uh, 2003. So the old solution is really beautiful. It shows the real power of SQL 92 because of its composability, basically. 
to what could you do before? If you want to have the result without any, any merging of rows, just start by getting the result. If you want on top of that, also have the aggregator, it's no problem. It's a Lego brick system. You can just join it to this result down there, and then you can select it. Okay, that's easy. You just combine both of them. That's how it works, it's composability. That's the real power of SQL. Except, yeah, I can see it in your faces. Yeah. <laughs> of course, just because you can, does not mean that it is a good way to do it. And this is the, the big um, <coughs> distinction we have with SQL 92 and what came later on. Later on, the, we have most of what came later on is just um, yeah, well, making, making things more handy, more practical, and also faster for runtime. So nowadays, the same query basically looks like this. You use the aggregate function without any um, group by, and instead of using group by, <coughs> you specify over which rows the aggregation shall be done. There's a new clause, the over clause, to specify over which rows the aggregation shall be done. So I would like to put that into more detail because it's really, really, really important. So if we start with a simple query and the result it may return, the first step is basically the comma. Because all I want to do is add another column. This is most of the time when you're using a window function, you're just adding another column. You're post-processing the result you already have. And if you want to use an aggregate function, okay, go ahead, take it. And if you don't want to use a group by at the same time, then you have to use instead of group by another way to specify over which rows the aggregation shall be done. <coughs> over which rows. That's the keyword. Over. And even the one you see there with the empty parenthesis, it's already valid. It means over everything. So what this um, sum function sees is basically the entire result set, so that the result of that is six times 6,000 because we have these six rows with each 1,000 there. So now we have aggregations without group by. Of course, we can do more fancy stuff. That's what we have the over clause for, basically. We can put in there the partition by clause. And please don't ask me why they didn't call it group by because it's basically the same. So it segregates the data according to the, to the values in those key columns and then you get different results for each partition. So that was the first part. And then it goes on. We can, in the over clause, we can also have an order by clause. And that's, that's kind of funny if you think of, of those aggregations we know, like min, max, sum, and so on. If, if we stick to sum, I mean, the last time I checked one plus two and two plus one, it kind of gave me the same result. So uh, why should we order anything there? And that's not the point about it, this order by clause. The point is not about sorting the result. In some cases it is, but not in most cases. The point is to establish a dialogue with the database. Hey database, I'm gonna tell you something and I'm gonna use some words like before and after. And when I use those words, then I refer to that order that I'm specifying there. I'll show you. Um, again, a query and the result it might give you. And I would like to add another column. These are basically transactions, like banking transactions, like deposit of 10, deposit of 20, withdrawal of, of uh, 10, and so on. And I would like to add another column that gives me the balance as of each transaction. So in the first one, it's done basically 10, then it turns 30, and then 20, if I take something out, and so on, and so on, and so on. So how to do that in SQL? Compose ability. You could just put a subquery there in the select clause. Yeah, yeah. You could. <laughs> this is not the way you want to go. Um, uh, it works. It was the valid solution until the uh, SQL 2003, basically. <coughs> um, but it has a lot of redundancy. So if you have where clauses in a main query, you need to repeat them in the in the uh, in the sub in, in the nested query. Um, you have to be damn careful that whatever you have in the order, you probably phrase there in the range condition. So uh, it's tricky and of course it's slow. So I would like to transform this into what I have just told you. Whenever you want to use an aggregate function but no group by, 
This is the trigger you need to remember. Then the over clause is what you like to do. And here we come to the framework, of course. So we want to aggregate something using sum, and instead of group by, we want to use over. And now is the question, how could I uh, express this, what I want to aggregate over? I cannot use partition by here, because partition by segregates on same value, on, on not distinct values, basically. And this is where the order by clause comes into the game. So first of all, I establish this order and tell the database, this is the order I'm referring to, basically chronologically in that case. And then I can use terms like, I would like to aggregate the rows between unbounded preceding whatever came before and the current row. Within this range, this is the range of rows I would like to provide to the sum function. And of course, in the very first row, this is just the first row itself. So it just gets the first row, the 10, and the result is 10. And at the second row, it's the first row until the current row. So two rows already. And so on, and so on. And this is how we do that nowadays. Yeah, there's just one problem. I was mixing actually um, your account, your withdrawals with your deposits. Because I forgot there's account, an account thing as well. But that's of course no problem because we can still combine that with partition by. And partition by um, isolates each partition from each other in a perfect sense. You cannot break out of a partition in that way. So you get it now on per account, account basis. So this is really the use for this order by in, in the over clause. And this is called framing. Um, but once we have an order, a different set of functions starts to make sense. And this is basically functions like this, like row number, rank, dance rank, and a few more, like percent rank, cumulus. You see, you can, now do, you can now leverage that order for other reasons. So there are other functions to use there as well. So to put that into a nutshell, what are the use cases for that? Whenever you want to do an aggregation but don't want to use group by, over is the answer. Remember that. This will be at the exam at the end. Um, running totals I've shown you, moving averages is just something different. You can also say it's like rows between three preceding and three following, no problem. Um, ranking, I've shown you the function, so one of the use cases is the top n per group, top n per partition basically in that case. So you are numbering row number, but partition by partition, and then you only take the three, for example, out of each partition, another use case. And whenever you see a self-join, who, who uses self-joins? Shame. <laughs> Shame on you. Shame on you. Self-choice is really a relict out of SQL 92, of the purely relational um, thinking. Get out of that. Whenever you see a self-join, fight it, kill it. Yeah. I always say, all employees must wash hands after using self-choice. <laughs> and one of the tools to um, replace self-choice is the overclass. There are others for other cases, but one of them is definitely the overclass. So there are countless, really countless use cases for that. You cannot imagine. I have one or more than later on. So can you use that in your database yet? Yes, probably you can, if you use any of those. Even if you're using SQLite. You see that small, tiny, green thingy there? Yeah, it's since last year it's there. Who is using SQLite? Yeah, you can use it, go ahead. Do you use it on Android? Yeah, then you have to wait like five years. <laughs> um, it's a truly important feature. It is so important that even the NoSQL vendors are implementing it. Look there. BigQuery has it. For many years. Who is using BigQuery? Oh, nobody. Oh, try one. So there are many NoSQL vendors who took up that, that idea. It's really, really important. Um, but I go on. I go on because there are other good features. I will upload the slides later on or tweet them or anything. I will make them available. Um, inverse distribution functions. Oh, I love that name. Percentiles. How to do percentiles in SQL? Easy. Composability. It's so easy. Look at that query. What a beauty. 
So what does it do? Basically, it takes the media, the middle value, out of an ordered set. Okay. Um, what it does, it, it numbers the row using the well-known data join. Oh, how we love it. We love it. Who loves that? <laughs> yeah, a yeah, join. Yeah. Um, so it basically numbering the rows using a data join and then taking the middle one. Yeah, isn't it beautiful? We are accessing the same tables three times. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. So this is pretty much my reaction to that. I can understand it has some beauty, but not for practical use. Um, that's the same query nowadays, basically. So there's a function, percentile discrete. 0 0.5 is the median. Within group, you order by that value. And you will also get that value back. So how does it work? 0 0.5 is the median. Um, this is what you order on, and also, unfortunately, also the value you get out of that function. And there are actually two different functions to do that. There's percentile disk and percentile cont for discrete values and for continuous interpolation. What's the difference? So if you have like four rows in that result set, um, it's hard to tell which one is the middle one. So that's why we have two different versions there. Um, the discrete is the one result which is actually part of this input. So it assigns the, the intervals like that. You see where it is inclusive. So the 0 0.5 gives you the second row in this example. Um, while the other one, the continuous, it takes the two um, neighboring values and does a linear interpolation between them. So you will get whatever is there in between those. And I would argue that's a little bit more convenient than the other query I've shown you. Can you use that yet? Uh, yeah, maybe. In some databases, you can use that. But it's arguably not the most commonly supported modern SQL feature. Yet, I like it very much because it makes it so much more easy. So this was some selected features out of SQL uh, 2003. I'm going now on over to 2008. And I must be honest, I've skipped over one, 2006. It's just because I don't like it so much. There was XML. Who is using XML? Oh, so uh, SQL can do XML. Take it for granted. Um, then we have SQL 2008. And there was an interesting feature called fetch first. Who knows these keywords, fetch first? Yeah. What? What is it about? Who knows limit? Huh? You see? You know it, actually. Limit is, is not SQL standard, but fetch first is. That's pretty much the only difference. And of course, fetch first is more powerful. So um, what is it about? If you want to get only the first, let's say, 10 rows, how could you do it? Well, of course, you could use the row number window function to number the rows and then just cut it off. Yeah, you can do that. Um, it's just a little bit, yeah, you need to nesting and so on. And yeah, OK, uh, let's face it. Let's just take limit or top if you're using SQL so. But now we have a common syntax which is standard uh, and it reads read like fetch first 10 rows only. And you can actually also say fetch first one row only. No, no yes. And you can then also say fetch next 10 rows only. Okay? So there are many, many keywords. And I think the people inventing this actually got paid for each keyword. <laughs> And who invented that? In my, in my slides, you can see that quite easily. So who was the first one turning green? It's a big blue elephant in the room. So apparently IBM uh, invented these keywords and then later on, like a decade later on, um, lobbied it into the standard. OK, so in some of the databases, you can use that already, in others not. It's no big deal, actually. I'm just putting this out to make it over to the next one, to the 2011 standard, because there they introduced something which I don't like so much. Offset. Who knows offset? Who likes offset? Who's using offset? Nobody brave enough. Ah, it's all, come on. <laughs> so, have you seen the coasters? <laughs> There's the no offset logo on it. There must be a reason for that. And offset is actually bad. I, I say all employees must chop off hands <laughs> after this. Event. There's actually really no excuse. Um, so first of all, what is it doing? And then I will briefly mention the problems. 
So what it is doing is it's throwing away some data which you yeah, have the effort to actually get it. It's typically used for pagination queries, like show me the first 10 rows, the next 10 rows, and so on and so on. Unfortunately, it is wrong. It gives you the wrong result for pagination queries. Because it is just the wrong approach to tell, I have seen 10 rows, and then using later another query, you say, okay, the next 10 rows must be the one after the first 10 rows. That is only true if the data hasn't changed in the meanwhile. If it did change, then everything is pushed, and it's not valid anymore. So you're not getting the correct result. And on top of, it, of that, it makes it slow, your query. The bigger the offset, the slower the query. So two, two benefits, to put it that way. It's wrong and slow, what I still need. So um, of course you can use it, but you shouldn't. Um, there are alternatives to use. Um, they are described on this website. And the UI is also printed on the coasters. And you can also take stickers there and learn how to do pagination without offset. So just because it's in the standard now, it's green everywhere, but that doesn't mean you should use it. You have been warned. OK, going on. Again, there is over. You have already seen over before, and it doesn't stop. I'll show you yet another that was then introduced with functions later on in SQL 2011. And now it's actually the reverse of what I've shown you before. Before I've had the transactions and wanted the balance. Now I have the balance and want the difference to the previous balance. So basically the tra transactions. How could we do that? And there's actually, if you use window functions, there was already a pretty easy solution to that. It's just you have to use this framing feature in a, in a fancy way. So it starts with an overclass. You establish some order by, of course. And then you can basically say rows between one preceding and one preceding. And this is not a typo. One preceding and one preceding. That's just the previous row. That's what you want to look at. And then you can basically use any, any aggregate function you would like. It's anyway, if there's only one row input, um, it doesn't matter. You can use min, max, you can even use sum if you want. Average if you're funky. Count would be wrong. But except count, everything is fine. Okay? It's just a single row there. So this, is, um, this was already possible before, but you see it's a little bit yeah, funky. So you have to, of course, take care of the nile for the first row because there is no previous one. So your code is getting to zero. And then you have basically the difference. But now we have a new function for that. The new query looks like this. And basically you say, lag behind one row according to that order and give it a balance. That's it. Just previous row. You can directly access now any row out of the, of the result. Basically. And if there is a function like lag, there is of course also a function like lead. You can look down into the future, so to say and use the next rows value already in this row. And there's first value, there's last value, there's nth value. You can ignore nulls, you can respect nulls, you just have to tell. And that's there as well. And pretty much every database is supporting the basic foundation of this, so lead and leg and for example. The nulls first, nulls last is not so widely supported, but you barely ever need that. It's, it's not really the most important feature. So you can use that as well. And then, there was the big feature in SQL 2011. System version. Who knows system version? Who knows temporal tables? Temporal, not temporary. Temporal. Yeah. Okay? This is what it is about. I'll show you. Um, the problem, or the critics, basically, of, of SQL 92 was also that um, these writing operations, they are destructive. The old data is gone. No way to recover it. Maybe from a backup, but not in a, in a SQL-ish way. And this has been changed. Now you can compare that a table shall be system version, for example. And the way you do it, um, yeah, well, you take just any normal table, you provide some meta columns, like here I've called the start TS for start timestamp. It's a timestamp type. And I use a special syntax. Generated always as row start. 
And this instructs the database, database, take care of this row, and whenever the validity of this row starts, put that timestamp in there. And I need to declare a second column like that, generated always as row end. These rows are not for you there to fiddle around. You cannot update them. The database takes care of it. That's why it is system versioning. The system takes care of the versioning. You have to tell the database that these two columns are the magic columns for that because you can have basically many of, the, of timestamps and so on. So you combine them into a period and then you enable with system versioning and bang, what happens? If you insert something, you don't mention these columns because it's transparent to the application. Yet the database will propagate those columns because you have instructed it to do so. And if you update, you end up with two physical rows there two physical rows, and the validity is set automatically by the database. Obviously, if you delete it, no surprise, it's not really gone, it's just not visible anymore. And of course, it's transparent. If you query it at any time in the normal way, you will just see it in the normal way. So if you query it after deleting it, it's gone, you get an empty result. But as the data is still there, there's a distinct syntax to actually access it. So in the from clause after the table name, you can say, I would like to look at that table as of that timestamp. And then you see it as of that timestamp. <coughs> as simple as that. Fully automatic. Can you use that yet? Uh, and some databases. So um, I'm really, really happy MariaDB is now there. There's healthy competition between MySQL and MariaDB by now. You see they are, they are introducing new features and putting pressure also on the open source databases. So is, is anyone using MariaDB here? Yeah, you can do it. Go ahead, it's for free. Okay, so this is one of the temporal features in SQL 2011. There's also the other one, the application versioning, but this is a little bit, um, yeah, not the scope of this talk today. So I'll go on to the current version of the SQL standard. It's the 2016 release. And there are two interesting features I've picked up. First of all, JSON table, or JSON in general. So SQL has now semantic understanding of JSON documents. It can really make sense out of these curly brackets and the columns and all of that. And JSON table in particular is a function where you can um, transform a JSON document into a more tabular form. Yeah? And it's actually, it's declarative, it's SQL. So this is how the query looks like. And if you look at it, it starts by, you need to provide some JSON data. I'm using a bind parameter here, the question mark, to, to you know, no SQL injection and so on. So it just provides some, some document. And then it goes on. Um, you have to use the SQL JSON path language, which is, in its purpose, very similar to um, XPath for XML. So who's, who's knowing XPath? Yeah, great. Or if you don't know XPath, like um, CSS selectors for HTML. Who's knowing CSS? Oh, fewer. That's interesting. Okay, so it's just a language where you can basically pick out some elements of a JSON document. And here the language basically reads like, start at the root, expect a narrator, and take all the elements. That's the start. And this one hits two elements. That means this document will be transformed into two rows. Each thing that is hit by this expression will be transformed into a row. And the only thing that's left then is to declare what the columns look like, should look like. And we have, of course, a columns clause for that. You see there already. Um, we declare names for the columns, types, and we use the same query language to say what data to propagate there. And that's it. You have transformed the JSON document to a more tabular form. The question is just, why? <laughs> why? Why would you ever, from the clients, document over there and then select it back to the client. Does that make sense? No. It's maybe not a useful feature if you look at it like this. But if you combine it with some other SQL features, like let's say insert maybe, then it might make sense. So you know, yeah, you are now transferring something you sent via this question mark into the database, transform it into more tabular form, and in the same step insert it into a regular base table. So you don't even need to transform the JSON document into some tabular form. If you want to insert it, you can do it on the database side in a declarative way. And of course, all the mapping in the other way is also there in SQL. You can also map it in the other way, like from a tabular form into a JSON document. It's all there. Can you use it yet? Yeah. 
yeah, it's coming. So Postgres has just committed like two weeks ago the first patch that made it there. So they have the JSON path language, but not the, the JSON table function yet. So it's coming. But for SQL terms, that's a quite recent feature. So you might have to wait um, uh, a little bit. A little bit. And then there is one last feature I would like to show you. Oh, how I love that. Match recognize. Who knows that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> you, you're free, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> um, what is it about? I'll show you one example, like log file analysis. Um, if you have a log file like this one, where the time goes by and you have events with timestamps, you sometimes have definitions like this, like a session. What, what constitutes a session? So everything that happens within 30 minutes of the previous event uh, continues the session, for example. And then you end up with, like in this example, four sessions. The question is, if you have one row for each of these events, how do you identify those sessions using SQL? And of course, it's totally easy, as you can see here on the screen. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually not complex. It's just a little bit nested. So what it boils down to, it's the innermost part, it just puts a tag, a start of group tag, for every time for the first event of each um, session. So it basically marks that one, and then that one, but not the other ones, and so on. And the next step is to basically just count how many of these tags have appeared so far. So I'm just counting, so first, and then second, and so on, you see? I'm just counting how many circles were before. And this is now a common criteria I can use for group bio for whatever you want. So now you have put a common criteria on each event of the same session. And that's called start of group tagging, and it's quite common and it works. Um, it's a little bit bulky. And now compare this to this little bastard. Who's that? This small boy. It's a regular expression. What do you think? Who would win? The regular expression or the previous query? Yeah, it's a teaser, the regular expression. So who knows regular expressions? Yeah, that's, that's what we are using it. Many people know that already. Um, regular expressions are designed to work on characters. But in SQL, we work on rules. That's the main difference. Other than that, you can reuse your knowledge already. So what match recognize basically is, it's a regular expression matching on rules. You can combine multiple rows into a match using regular expressions, as you know them. Except they are not working on, on characters, but on rows. That means, while in normal regular expressions, each character stands for its own, except a few special characters, there is no such thing for, for rules. So we have to define a special vocabulary. And this is, um, actually we have a clause for that, it's called define clause. So you can say, for example, any row where the status is 99 qualifies as a deleted row. So you define a vocabulary. Deleted is now basically a name. And you can even do more interesting things, like in this example, you can say, Everything where the current timestamp falls within the range of the previous timestamp plus 30 minutes qualifies as continuation of the current session. And this vocabulary you can then use in something like this, like in a pattern. You can say match one row which is deleted and then as many as you like that qualifies for that. That's the star from regular expression, the asterisk here. As many as you like, zero till infinity. And the full query basically looks like yeah, um, this. You have to de define class at the bottom, then you have the pattern there, then you can say that you, for, for example, want to group, group it, one row per match, you can also say all rows per match, um, and the measures class is basically like the select, so you declare the columns. And that's it. That's SQL standard by now, and yeah, I think it's a little bit more easy, and you can do really, really funky stuff with this, with regular expressions, there's no how you might already have. So there's an entire different presentation of me. You can look at that for more use cases. But here are the bad news. <laughs> Who's using Origin? Uh, in the meanwhile, there is Oracle 18XE, the free edition. So you can technically, if you want to play around, you can download it for free and play around with that on Origin 18. Um, there's also some, some things happening. So I hope more databases will take this up. So to conclude, you know what that is? The tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg. This is what I've shown you now. Really. Just a few hand-picked 
users. There are literally 100 more features for you to discover. And many of them are useful and are elegant solutions for problems which are, let's say, a little bit yeah, awkward to solve in, in, in SQL 92. So really, keep in mind, SQL 92 is not the state of the art. A lot has changed since then, really a lot. And SQL, in my opinion, has evolved beyond the relational idea. We are not, not um, to this purely um, um, matrix kind of thinking and tables. We have document types, we have nested types, we have all of that, like this JSON and the transformations and so all of that. It has really changed. And join is not the holy grail, it's one of the tools, but there are many other tools like window functions and, and this match recognized. And if you're using SQL, if this is the one thing, if you only remember one single thing from this presentation, make it this one. If you're using SQL only for CRUD operations, then you're doing it wrong. You're not actually using SQL then. You're kind of misusing it. SQL is a transformation language. You can see you can transform some data in some funky but still easy ways. And you can apply algorithms like regular expression matching and all of that. And it makes really sense. So please, stop using it just for CRUD. Um, so why is it modern SQL? Modern SQL is just my name I made up for this. this yeah, you need to know everything that happened after SQL 92. It's a website of me. You can, you, know, you can take stickers. There are stickers. You can follow it. So I'm blogging about these topics. You will find these slides and more slides on modernsql.com. And yeah, I have another website called Use Index Look. It's the cutest GDI squirrel on the world. You see that one? There are also stickers, and it's on the coasters. So grab them if you like them. And follow these sites if you're interested in more of these. So then, we do have some time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, any First. questions? Yeah. First, let's. Distinct keywords are recurring, but it would be actually easy to find out. So I have the standard there. I can open it and count it, but I don't know it by heart. But, okay. so it's, it, it, it's not so bad. Okay. It's just this fetch first thingy, you know? Everything else is quite straight. Okay. Any other questions? If you don't have questions, I just ask you. <laughs> so, like, what is your favorite? Ah, you have one. Uh, okay. Well, the fetch first, you said that there's also next, which would sort of. Yes. Yeah. For the fetch first, there's also which is intended to be used together with offset, which you don't want to use. Ah, so don't use that. Yes. You can, but you don't. Yes, another question. Um, do you claim that you have uh, actually read the standards from start to finish? Like the last standard is more than 1,600 pages long. Yeah, so do I claim that I read the standard from beginning, from cover to cover? No, I don't. Um, what I say is other standards, uh, other people study the Bible. I study ISO 1975, um, which is the standard version, basically. Um, all parts together is more than 5,000, no, 4,000 pages about. No, I don't. And one of the aim of this modern SQL website is actually so that you don't need to. I'm putting it in more accessible terms there. But I'm studying it. I'm not reading it. I'm, nobody ever did. It's, li it's like... <laughs> nobody ever. Pretty sure. And there's no single window whose parts full of the standard. It's impossible, I think. Okay, at the back. Which, which database is most standard compliant? Which database is most standard compliant? Out of those I'm testing here, it's Postgres. And there was another question. Yeah, so, how are we going to educate people to use more of these modern features? It's, well, maybe by having the yeah. So how to educate people to make use of it? Go, go to conferences, talk about it, um, tweet about this, take stickers. I don't have a better answer. Yeah, another question. So if SQL is so powerful, how, how do you figure out which parts in the SQL and which you implement in the accessing programming language? So again, I did. Like, so how, how do you figure out which part of your program you implement in SQL and which ah. of it? How to, okay. How to figure out which part of your program to implement in SQL and which part to do in some other other programming language? Um, well, that's out of experience. You cannot decide that if you don't know what SQL can do. So, 
you first have to know what SQL, and in particular your SQL database can do, and then you can also decide um, whether it makes sense or not. So for me it's quite easy because I know all of these features and how they work, but of course for somebody who doesn't know what SQL can do, it's impossible to decide. So you have first to learn them, or at least to get some teasers like this one, and then... Is there like a hard line where you say, I possibly could implement in SQL, but then... Yes. So there, there are some things you could implement in SQL, but I won't. Um, when it comes to graph processing, quite often, so these recursive algorithms and so on, um, you can do it, but it doesn't always make sense. Um, yeah, there, there's some experience, and there is no sharp line where you can say, okay, this is the red line, so far, no further. It's really like, yeah. Okay. Last question. Last okay. question. So um, maybe there's a reason why many people are sticking to SQL 92. So um, I mean, many vendors have their own proprietary extensions, and uh, uh, if you if you want to do anything that is advanced, then you're sort of getting into the, the ruts of mm. using these extensions, and then you're sort of stuck. Yeah, the right? vendor locking yeah. argument. This is what I'm fighting with the website. So I make the differences visible. Um, imagine, who knows, can I use the, the site for CSS? That's what I'm working on for S SQL. And the vendors, it, it always starts working. They see that sometimes all other vendors are doing it, but they not. They are following me, I know that. Um, so I'm working on that. Uh, the help I actually need is to spread the word about it. So that was the last question, so thank you. Um, I have to clean up the desk. I will leave that one here for a while. You can also take it later on. And the next one uh, is already waiting. Yeah.